Hello everyone and welcome to Undercurrent News, what COVID-19 means for Seafood M&A webinar. I'm Tom Seaman, the co-founder of Undercurrent and I'll be moderating this global panel today from my home office in South East London. On the panel, we're going to be discussing the outlook for mergers and acquisitions in the seafood sector in light of the coronavirus pandemic. And before we get going, I'd like to thank Antarctica Advisors, Seabank Capital Markets and Pontus Aqua for sponsoring the webinar. Ignacio from Antarctica and Tim from KeyBank are also both on the panel. I'd like to put out the disclaimer here that the panel discussion has been put together entirely by Undercurrent with no outside influence from sponsors. I guess that's shown by the fact we have other competitors on the panel who are not sponsors. So the purpose of this webinar is to hear from some of Seafood's top deal makers on the outlook for M&A in the sector. Taking a step back, there has been a dramatic hike in M&A in seafood over the last few years. We've also seen an increase in cross-border and cross-sector deals, where companies are expanding outside their home, geographies and species. The most notable example of this is Canada's Cook, which has gone from farming salmon in rural New Brunswick to snapping up aquaculture and wildcat operations globally. As well as Cook, the likes of Leroy from Norway, Spain's Profund, Oceana and Sea Harvest from South Africa, and Thai Union of Thailand, to name a few, have all done deals either outside their core geography or species group in recent years. So, will a pandemic slow down or even stop this global consolidation as financing dries up? Or will we see an explosion of deals as stronger players snap up distressed ones? Or maybe it'll be somewhere in the middle. Anyway, we've convened a panel of experts on seafood m &A from around the world to discuss the outlook. So first of all, I'll let the panel introduce themselves then I'm going to give you a short presentation on the background and outlook. That should take about 10 minutes. Then we'll get to the panel. After the panel, we'll take audience questions. So the whole webinar will take between 75 and 90 minutes. So let's get to the intros, starting with Alan, and then we'll kind of work around alphabetically. So Alan, maybe you could introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, my name is Alan Lung. I'm the uh, founder of Mount Vantage. Uh, I started advising on agriculture M&A in Vietnam almost 10 years ago. And I have done deal in around Asia since. Uh, we work with seafood companies in Asia to raise funds um, and divestitures um, of both seafoods and agri-tech companies. Uh, it's very nice meeting you all virtually. Thanks, Alan. Um, maybe we could go to Henning now. And Henning is having some difficulties with his video. so. He's going to just be a kind of a black screen today, unfortunately. But yeah, Henning, maybe you could just introduce yourself. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, my name is Henning Lun. I'm working at uh, Pareto Securities uh, on the investment banking side. Uh, prior to working uh, on investment banking, I was an equity analyst on the seafood sector for, for more than 15 years. Um, so I've been focusing on the seafood sector for, for, for uh, quite some time now. Thanks. Thanks, Henning. Ignacio? Ignacio, you've, you've muted yourself. Okay, again, uh, hello everyone. Ignacio Kleiman here from Antarctic Advisors based in the US. Uh, we are a seafood focused uh, MA advisor uh, doing transactions. Uh, in the Americas and globally as well. Uh, happy to be here and uh, share with you some ideas today. Cheers. So over to you, Jose Antonio. Maybe you could just give an intro. Thanks, Tom. Um, very nice to be with you today. Uh, this is Jose Antonio Zarzalejos. I'm a partner with PwC based in Madrid. I'm responsible for the uh, consumer sector in our deals division. Uh, been involved in a number of transactions in the seafood space in particular in frozen and in canned seafood. Very happy to be here with you guys. Great, good to, good to have you on, on the panel. Um, Magnus, maybe give an intro to yourself. Thank you, Tom. Uh, my name is Magnus Bjarnason uh, with Mara Flysos in Iceland. Uh, I have been active in seafood every day for the last 15 years or so, uh, both from lending uh, advisory and also management uh, point of view. Uh, been quite active in North America and Europe. Look forward to this to the webinar. Thank you. Great, and um, Matthias. Matthias, I think you're muted. 
Ah, let's try again. Nice yeah. meeting you. Uh, my name is Matthijs Dirk of Squarefield, founded Squarefield uh, in 08 in the previous crisis. We have a dedicated focus on the food and agri market with our uh, office in Amsterdam. We are covering Western Europe, but dependent on the, the sector or the request of our clients, we go globally. And the seafood industry as such is one of the uh, subsectors within food and agri, which uh, we are quite active in. Okay, and last but not least, we've got Tim. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tim Lennox from KeyBank Capital Markets. I head up our seafood practice out of Seattle, Washington, and we do everything from uh, kind of corporate advisory all the way to traditional and activities on that front. So looking forward to having a good discussion today, and uh, thanks for having us. Okay. So I'm going to kick things off with a brief presentation on the on the outlook, if I can work out how to share my screen. Great, here we go. So yeah, give me the first slide. So before um, talking about the outlook with the with the panel, we thought it'd be a good idea to just kind of give a bit of a, a top level overview of some of the data which we've accumulated over the years, um, tracking um, tracking M and A. So we saw in 2019 was, was a very strong year for deals. Um, there was 153 separate transactions that we, we kind of, um, that we, we tracked. There might well have been more because there's often deals that go, go on that you don't even, you know, that, don't, that aren't even made public due to the kind of the private nature of the sector sometimes. And that was up 16% um, uh, year on year, but a dramatic increase on, um, on 2015 when only 94 deals were completed. And then if we look at the, uh, the deal spend, um, it was also an extremely strong year. We saw close to um, $5.2 uh, billion um, spent on deals in, in 2019. And this was only from, deal, this was from deals where the, uh, the deal price was made public or we were able to kind of estimate it in any kind of sensible way. Um, so they might, again, the number would have actually been higher than this. And the, the only year that we, we've, we tracked since 2015 that was higher than this was, was 2015 itself when um, 5.8 was spent. But that was really kind of skewed by two massive deals. There was um, uh, the Cargill acquisition of, of EWOS, uh, which was a $1.5 billion deal. And then also SVH acquired Natreco. Um, and we kind of estimated that the seafood portion of that deal was, was about a, um, a, billion, a billion dollars. I mean, the, the, the deal price was higher. So it was really those two deals that kind of um, skewed that figure um, up. Yeah, if you, next slide. Yeah, and then if we look at the top deals from, from last year, it was actually a lot of large transactions. It wasn't really so much a couple of huge ones that kind of skewed it. Um, so yeah, the, all of the, um, the top five deals were over $400 million and a couple that were, were, touching, uh, were touching a billion. Um, and we also see, saw quite a lot of consolidation activity in the in the farm salmon um, in the farm salmon sector, which um, yeah was um, was interesting to note. Something we'll explore later in the. In the but we also saw several deals from private equities as well, um, which um, we saw platinum. Um, snapping up Ibiconsa. And then if you look at this this next chart, we can see a, a dramatic increase in the percentage of um, of deals from the, the financial financial sector, which is up to almost 30% for transactions uh, we've seen so far in, uh, in 2020. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Are you able to move on? Yeah, it froze. Sorry, I'll share my screen again now.
Should be able to see it, Tom. Yeah. Um, is this showing as well on the webinar if I'm talking? Are you able to kind of do that so it shows? Yeah, okay. So yeah, and we um, we saw 2020 get off to a flying start. We had the uh, the FCF deal for Bumblebee closing at the end of January, which was, um, yeah, $930 million deal. And, you know, it, it, at that point, I mean, the pandemic was obviously still, um, it, was, it was really impacting um, things in China and you could start um, to feel it was going to move to um, to Europe and the US, and if you look at the deals that we've tracked um, so far this year, we've definitely seen a slowdown in in Q2. But actually, you know, if you look at Q1, it was it was very strong in terms of the number of deals. Um, then we've seen a, a definite slowdown in Q2, but also it's still far better than maybe um, I would have thought when you know we first started to look at the, the imp impact of this pandemic the one thing we have noted is a drop in the amount of cross-border deals um seen that definitely um reduce in the in the second quarter and potentially um you know possible theory about that might be that m and um, the deals that are getting done are more localized and that's that's something that um we'll explore with the panel um, after the presentation But then you definitely, if we, if we look at it, the quantity of cross-sector deals is not really reduced. That's the kind of um, deals where companies are buying other companies, which are somewhat out of their um, kind of, you know, pillar, I guess, one of a better word in the industry, which, which maybe suggests that um, diversification is something which is, is continuing in, in acquisitions and companies are looking to that in this situation. And then when we look at the kind of the news flow, um, the kind of stories which have been cropping up on M&A, um, it shows again that um, suggests that deals will continue. We've got uh, most of the founders of Clearwater talking, you know, positively about the sale. Um, you know that the, the coronavirus, uh, the pandemic, will be a disruption, but but it's not going to, you know, it doesn't change the essential plan that they have to, you know, to strategically sell the business. And then. Couple of other stories there. The Santa Monica Seafood talking bullishly about about deals and getting their company in shape to kind of almost take advantage of the situation. And a similar um, sort of viewpoint was presented by um, Philosophish as well, which is a, a private equity backed um, bass and bream farmer. So it shows that companies are kind of some companies are getting on the front foot in this situation and thinking of how they can capitalize on the situation. But then, I mean, we've definitely also seen uh, more distressed deals happening. I mean, these are a couple of pretty small examples. These are not major transactions, but they're, they're examples of companies that have got into problems that really the pandemic has exacerbated and, and caused them to, to go into administration. I mean, in, in the case of Telson, there's a lot of other factors, but the pandemic won't have helped. So that maybe suggests that we're going to see more um, of this type of deal making in 2020 more more distressed deals, um, more deals driven by kind of um, financial um, difficulties that maybe feel like this is the start of, of, of this and this is another thing which we will um, explore um, later with the panel. So that, that really covers it for, for, the, um, for the presentation. Just wanted to do a kind of a, a broad sort of top level view on, um, on a, on what, what's happened in the sector, what we've seen in, in, in 2020 and yeah, and how, and then we can really move to the, uh, move to the panel and get cracking with what, what the guys think about what the outlook is. So yeah, I'd really like to go around the panel for everyone to give a kind of assessment of how the pandemic has impacted the uh, M&A and the geography that you cover, and then give, give us a sense of what you think will happen over the rest of 2020. And Magnus, I'd like to start with you here. I mean, you, you just stepped down from ICE, from the, the chairman role at ICE and Seafood to focus on my advisors full time um, when then, then this pandemic hit. Wondering how you're seeing it impact your business and then, um, you know, what's your view on the, on the outlook for 2020? Magnus, you're muted. 
you're muted. I'm sorry. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah, before everyone speaks, they need, to, they need to remember to unmute themselves because I think maybe it's getting muted automatically. So just check that. Yeah, we can hear you now. Fine. Go ahead. Yeah, th but th thank you very much, Tom, and thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, it was a nice overview. Uh, I think if I start to answer your question about what impact has this on my business, uh, it has had much less impact than I thought in, in March when this was all starting. So I think uh, uh, we, kind of like who are working in the industry, have been surprisingly quick to adjust to, to a, a new life. Obviously, we are, we are not traveling. But that does not stop kind of like all kinds of developments taking place. But then the other question is, what impact will it have on seafood M&A? And I think maybe in the short term, uh, there will be some delays. And I think the delays are maybe caused by two factors. Uh, one, because of travel restrictions and uncertainty, uh, things will slow a bit down. Uh, but the other is kind of like valuation gaps. Uh, obviously, kind of like when you have sort something like uh, COVID hitting uh, uh, the seafood industry, it has impact on profitability, and profitability has impact on valuations. I'm not saying uh, that it is a long-term impact because we all expect that we will somewhat get to normal, even though there is an uncertainty about how quickly that will happen. Uh, will we have a, a second wave and third wave and so forth, or will it just be kind of like? coming through this wave, like it uh, happened with SARS in China back in 2003, uh, when, when it all got under control and life started to become normal again uh, in a matter of six months or so. If that is the case, then the valuation gap is not that great. It is only kind of to discount the uh, lost cash flow during that period. But if it is a, a longer uh, and more permanent impact, then obviously that, that will impact the all valuations. And I think this is always always difficult for everyone to accept, and it takes some time to sink in. But then the other uh, impact is uh, simple, practical things. You know, this it is more difficult to do to deal with this, and uh, things will slow down because of that. But I absolutely agree with your slides, and and the long-term outlook is uh, for uh, more activities, more transactions, and uh, so we, we will get through this this COVID pandemic. And, and I think the medium and long-term outlook is, is quite interesting and you will see a lot of seafood transactions taking place and that is simply driven by the needs from the biggest customers of the industry. Uh, it doesn't matter if it is uh, big retail customers in, in Europe or, or elsewhere, you know, they are all asking for bigger organizations, more vertical integrations and, uh, and more sophistication and therefore the industry has to adopt and then there will be therefore naturally more transactions taking place. No, oh, thank, thanks a lot, Magnus. Yeah. Now, Ignacio, I mean, your, your business similarly is, is, is a hundred percent focused on, on seafood. Um, so yeah, I mean, give us a, give us a sense of what you've seen, um, happen, um, as a result of the pandemic and then a bit of a, a bit of an outlook as well. Yeah, I, I tend to echo what uh, what Magnus was saying. You know, um, there's a bit of a slowdown, but it hasn't stopped. Uh, you know, some uh, some boards had made uh, you know long-term strategic decisions. So you know, while we adapted to the current situation where you cannot travel or maybe you know complete certain aspects of due diligence, uh, you know, we have managed to continue. You know, uh, in the preparation or anything I had to. You know, could be done uh, desktop, uh, you know, by video and whatnot, uh, and that was on the on the on the first two months of uh, of this pandemic situation. Uh, what uh, we have found, on the other hand, is that uh, past you know the, the the peak of the crisis a little bit when people started understanding how to manage uh, the current situation, uh, and uh, they had stabilized a little bit their own business situation. Uh, attention to long-term strategies and, and decisions made pro-COVID uh, came back. I mean, the, 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 the good side of not being able to travel is that your clients are much more available, uh, you know, for discussions, you know, for phone calls, you know, uh, and uh, video calls, and therefore certain aspects of the, the process have accelerated. Um, you know, in our case, you know, surprisingly enough, you know, in the last uh, over the last couple of weeks, you know, we came to the market with a 
the couple of transactions, you know, uh, slowly being very cautious in terms of what the timeline is, uh, and you know, have continued uh, uh, advancing on some others, uh, and and yeah, clearly, you know, there, there are others that uh, had to be put a little bit on hold uh, because they require more of traveling, more personal contact, more of uh, uh, you know, plan visits or site visits, uh, and therefore those are a little bit more challenging. Um, what do we expect, uh, you know, over the next couple of months? Uh, you know, if hopefully at least the, the health situation stabilizes a little bit, uh, and then, you know, the travel situation starts improving, uh, uh, people will be able to start paying attention to longer term, you know, strategic decisions uh, that have to do with, you know, either strengthening their balance sheet or uh, becoming more efficient. Uh, or accessing, you know, uh, uh, strategic assets that they need, uh, and we expect, you know, the second half of the year to be a little bit more uh, active, uh, particularly, you know, the uh, the last quarter. Uh, in good part, uh, also, the, also the delays have to do with uh, the commercial banks uh, moving slowly towards, you know, the new reality. Uh, and being able to, uh, you know, open up the purse to finance transactions as well. Th thanks, Ignacio. Interesting stuff. Yeah, now, um, Tim, maybe you could um, give us your view from the uh, from on on the sort of situation with the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. Um, yeah, what what's your view? Well, certainly, uh, we are right now in the thick of the beginning of the salmon season. Uh, Pollock bee season is about to kick off. So kind of COVID is front and center. Um, there certainly has been some distractions here in the, uh, in the U S that have kind of focused, but I think that has still been a critical component to the, uh, kind of long-term stability and ability to get the, the, those seasons in processing and harvesting completed. So that's really been kind of part of the focus that uh, has been touched on a little bit earlier here is that when COVID came and hit, everyone kind of turned it themselves internally focused and have been very much uh, keen on making sure they're going to be able to manage through this massive disruption, particularly on the food service uh, aspect of their business. So, um, but I think with with respect to the outlook, there still are several fundamental uh, dynamics that are uh, in play and will continue to drive transactions here going forward with. Um, more and more uh, professional management teams coming into businesses that are then able to uh, position themselves to be sold or to acquire other companies is really allowing for uh, more activity in the space. And I think it is kind of a theme that's been ongoing now for several years has always been an aging ownership group. And I think this uh, recent uh, pandemic is certainly going to be a Kind of realization for several owners that they need to be in a position to weather certain storms or uncertainties and and being in a position to uh you know look to to monetize their investment um and so kind of touched on is is with ignacio said i think really opening up the credit markets here in the us is going to be um i think an ongoing challenge for banks as we're continuing to on the lending side feel out what, what's going to be happening and the, the long-term impact and whether or not demand is actually going to be coming back or if we have a uh, fundamental shift in consumer trends. So I think that's going to be causing this uh, you know transaction momentum to be slowed until there's some more clarity into uh, you know how the consumer is going to be reacting going forward and if any of the changes that we're having now are going to be more permanent on that front or if it's going to be something that we can get back to some level of normalcy relatively quickly and then potentially have a boon in, in demand and in, in a pickup here going forward. So I think there's there's a lot of focus on what's going to be happening with this upcoming season here in the Northwest and hoping that all of the harvest will be able to be completed and then the consumer demands on the demand side will be able to pick back up once we're able to get through, uh, through our, our COVID situation here. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. Well, we're now moving over from, from the US to Europe. Um, Matthias, you, you're doing um, deals in other food sectors with Squarefield. Um, how do you see the outlook for seafood M&A developing in Europe compared to the, um, the, the rest of the agribusiness sector? Yeah, well, the, the, I think a lot of uh, trends and developments uh, which are applicable for other markets are also applicable for the European market. 
the positive thing is about being in seafood or the positive thing about having a focus on food and agri that this industry is uh, relatively resilient for for crisis uh, people need to eat and especially all the consumption patterns for seafood are still positive uh, nevertheless what we see uh, the COVID situation a lot of companies have been focusing, focusing internally, uh, focusing on supply chain, uh, supply chain uh, difficulties, challenges, but also production processing challenges, having the right people, uh, and, and illness, uh, which is uh, in some cases quite uh, substantially. And uh, what also was mentioned is the banks, they uh, pretend still to be open, but uh, the reality is they are re reluctant to finance transactions these days. But uh, what we uh, see is um, we accomplished or executed two seafood deals uh, during the COVID period for strategics. So I think that's an example that, that people are still looking or still busy with the acquisitions. But um, the, there's definitely a slowdown in, in the number of transactions, but I will see, I'm certainly convinced that the, the whole trend of the consolidation, especially on the processor side and the Western European market is also to a large extent very much more a, a seafood processing uh, part of the value chain. And we see, we expect uh, con uh, consolidation to continue, but not all uh, will be out of luxury. Uh, there will be a lot of distressed assets uh, because in the market there are still a lot of small players focusing or having or being dependent on specific end markets uh, like in, for instance food service or logistics and they are facing difficulties and they uh, they have problems I think in surviving so they need to uh, uh, to be acquired by, by the larger ones. Um, but in general, uh, there is a slowdown, but definitely it will, the consolidation will continue. You're on mute, uh, Tom. There we go. And just to be clear, the two deals you say you've worked on there, is that the, um, the Kenamovis one uh, for the, and, and, the, and then the, uh, the Telson one, is that? No, no, it tells them uh, <laughs> I was not involved in that uh, transaction. But right. we, uh, we advised the seafood company on the divestment of Class Pool to Sykes. Uh, of course, yeah. Football m and activity. And Ken Mavis acquired yeah. both Sykes uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, the, the Sykes deal sort of went through just as it really started to kind of kick off in Europe, didn't it? It was, you know, just at that point. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, okay, well, well to, to another European advisor, um, Jose Antonio, I was um, interested uh, to, to ask you about the, the shelf, shelf stable and the frozen sectors in Europe, which are kind of big focuses for you, and, and both have been, you know, performing comparatively well um, in, the, in this pandemic from, you know, from what I gather. Do you think that is going to precipitate more M&A in those kind of um, segments of the European seafood sector? Yeah, well, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as you say, we've seen um, those specific kind of verticals of the seafood space performing quite well throughout this COVID um, crisis. Um, having said that, probably the frozen kind of part of things uh, has you know, taken a hit, given the fact that they have strong focus on the food service industry. Uh, and the increase in consumption um, at a household level hasn't really compensated that decrease in volumes that typically are being driven mainly by the food service industry. But having said that, um, um, I'm quite sort of aligned with Tim's views on on a couple of aspects that have to do with the money activity happening, you know, uh, on this side of the pond. Basically, um, we're probably going to see more local MLA activity uh, um, to the extent that uh, players are typically in this context a bit more cautious about cross-border M&A activity. So we'll probably see some further local consolidation. Uh, and that's basically driven by the fact that uh, we still have a relatively large number across Europe, but mainly in Southern Europe, uh, of small and medium companies which are still family-owned. And the whole you know, pandemic has probably scared many of these families operating uh, SMEs uh, and probably just thinking that given the level of uncertainty that they're currently facing, 
it's probably time to monetize their investments and probably time to walk away from the sector and just leave, you know, these businesses um, to being taken care of by larger players. So um, on the back of a reasonably decent performance of both um, the shelf stable and frozen sectors, we do expect a uh, decent amount of M&A uh, deals taking place in the space, but with a stronger focus on local activity and with family-owned businesses probably restructuring themselves. Uh, thanks a lot. Well, um, now Henning, over to 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 you in the uh, in, in in the Nordic region, um, and yeah, just interested to get a perspective from you on the the outlook for M and A in salmon farming and processing um, farming in Norway, obviously, and then process salmon processing in continental Europe. Um, do you foresee the pandemic driving more consolidation in these subsectors? Hi Dom. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, the, the, in, in general, I've uh, seen the M and A activity in the salmon farming as uh, as uh, quite low, but ongoing for for some years. Uh, we don't see any big changes on that uh, uh, due to the uh, pandemic, but we do think that consolidation on the sand farming uh, will continue. But that will be driven more on, on optimizing operation and scale effects and, and, and new regulations and, and generation shifts uh, more than more than the pandemic actually. Uh, when it comes to the processing part, it's, so we do that. One of the one, one of the I think we I think we have learned from the pandemic is that, uh, and the farmers have learned is to the value see the value of of, uh, of being through the whole value chain. And, uh, and uh, as mentioned from from the speakers before, uh, especially those uh, uh, mid products, uh, pre-packed consumer products into retail and and also e-trade, uh, I think we will see. Uh, more folks from the bigger uh, the salmon farming companies on that part of, of, of the value chain. Um, so, yeah, the answer is yes, uh, a small increase maybe in, in, uh, in due to the pandemic uh, on the processing part, but, uh, but uh, uh, the state ongoing on the salmon farming sector. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah with them, um, I guess with the um... Last year, we saw a few um, sales of smaller family-owned companies, and then also, obviously, uh, the Norway Royal Salmon divestment as well. So, do, do you think that there'll be uh, more kind of, of the the smaller family-owned companies will um, get snapped up by the the bigger ones, or do you think there could potentially be mergers between smaller companies to form you know larger kind of private-owned companies, or you know, sort of give us a bit more detail on how you think it will evolve in in Norway in the salmon sector. Yeah, and we, we were advisor for, for one of the smaller companies uh, that we acquired uh, last year. And uh, I think we will see more of that. Uh, I think it will be uh, more difficult to be uh, a very small salmon farmer. And I think it will be uh, more important to, to uh, have integrated operations. So I, think, oh, but, so I also think that we will see mergers uh, between medium-sized uh, companies. and in kind of some mergers and some cooperations uh joint ventures and uh, but also uh ongoing consolidation on especially from the smallest uh farming companies and that will probably also be due to generation shifts uh, as one uh, as a trigger in in, in, in for, for, for some thanks Henning. um yeah alan over 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 to you i mean have you seen um how have you seen um, the pandemic impacting um, the M and A um, in seafood in in Asia, and then and then kind of what's your sort of um, short and medium term outlook on that? Thank you. Um, like Matthias mentioned, uh, demand for animal protein is still here. Uh, everybody staying home around the world has helped consumer to learn how to prepare seafood at home. Um, deals in two. Deals that were ongoing in January 2020 are still racing to the finish line. Like you mentioned, you know, FCF's Bumblebee, uh, Isui Marabeni to Danish Salmon, um, the Hughes uh, announced the acquisition of Navodia Indonesia uh, yesterday, um, and Bioma is still signing an MNU with Via Oak to invest in the stream nutrition business. Um, obviously, for Asia, on site DD 
uh, for cross-border deals has become a major challenge. Um, I echo Tim's view in terms of finding the right professional management team that is separate from the owner family being often a very important prerequisite for a successful M&A sale. Um, there is a very scarce supply in Asia for sizable targets with strong management team. And, but however, this pandemic will make companies even stronger in the medium and long term. Um, valuation gaps remains to be an issue, um, but large companies with very good access to capital and customers will weather extreme volatility in trade. Hence, they are not in any kind of particular hurry to sell, especially in relation to accessing American or European buyers. Um, finally, there's a trend to uh, invest or do M&A in agri-tech uh, to help control costs and to improve on food security. Th thanks, Alan. You mentioned cross, cross-border deals there briefly, but I wanted to, to ask you a bit more about that. I mean, are you, do you think that There'll be a tendency for when things kind of start to um, to, to normalize or move to the, the new normal. Uh, there'll be more cross-border deals in Asia as companies look to, you know, say the big Japanese or Korean companies or look to sort of diversify their supply base. So they're not like locked in with, you know, one country in terms of supply. Do you think that could be a trend or do you, do you think that it'll be quite quiet on the cross, cross-border um, front for the, for the foreseeable future? I think that for Japanese and Korean companies, and in addition to Western companies, generally speaking, they are trying to access resources in Asia. Um, the, the challenge for a lot of these companies is often how do they access resources? Because in, in Asia, Asia is a big space, right? There are a lot of different laws, different, different jurisdictions. Um, but like Japanese and Korean companies, for example, they are very uh, experienced in, in accessing say southeast asia or, or south asia jurisdictions and indeed they have continued to do it uh during the pandemic and try to see what kind of avenue of growth uh that they can execute in the future and i think they're monitoring the situation very closely to see whether they can somehow achieve an edge um, as you already know a lot of companies in asia already have offices or boots on the ground for a lot of jurisdictions right for, for major seafood jurisdictions like China, like Vietnam, like India, they already have people on the ground. So they can access deals immediately that are perhaps much more difficult for, say, uh, private equity. Okay, th thanks, Alan. And on the, um, on the cross-border front, I mean, Ignacia, I wanted to get some, some thoughts from you on this because, you know, you've... You've um, you've done several deals over the the past few years, which have both been resource based and sort of market based, where it's been foreign companies, overseas companies getting into the U.S. Um, do you think that 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 will continue, or will that um, that be kind of a bit subdued by this situation, and the, the deals you're working on will be more you know U.S. Uh, companies buying other U.S. companies? Mute. Sorry, I meant, uh, I think that this is going to accelerate uh, and there are going to be certain, you know, long-term uh, strategic changes in the market, I believe. Uh, you know, this, this pandemic really broke up, uh, you know, the value chains uh, both ways, you know, for uh, large companies in the U.S. accessing, you know, raw material uh, and for raw material producers overseas uh, also realizing that they couldn't reach their markets. Uh, you know, and, and, and at the beginning created a little bit of, uh, of chaos there. Uh, two topics that, uh, you know, we strongly believe are going to bubble up uh, are, you know, uh, secure market access or, or market control, you know, for large, uh, you know, uh, uh, raw material producers, both, you know, uh, wild card and, and also particularly uh, um, agriculture. Uh, you know, they will want in the future to make sure that they can access and control uh, the value chain uh, all the way to the market, because otherwise they get stuck with the product uh, and, uh, you know, causing, causing tremendous uh, pain uh, on, the, on the origination side. Uh, but likewise, you know, at least in the U.S. Uh, and I would say Canada as well, uh, you know, the, the lack of control over uh, the resources, you know, given that, 
you know, at least in the U.S., you know, we import close to 90% of the seafood we consume every day. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll bubble up the topic of uh, food security. Uh, you know, probably the first reaction that we saw in this changing attitude uh, is the, the latest uh, um, proclamation uh, of support for uh, acceleration of um, uh, aquaculture produced in the U.S. Uh, yeah. That had never happened before, uh, and, and, uh, and probably, you know, what we're going to see over the next five years is uh, an increasing uh, value uh, or strategic value of having, you know, uh, locally produced uh, seafood um, and uh, not only for con quality control, but also to make sure that in the future, uh, if, uh, you know, the, 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 the distribution chain, the logistic chains, they break up, uh, you know, product is still available to the market, at least for certain species. Uh, but, you know, uh, clearly, uh, there is going to be consolidation. Clearly, you know, we need larger players as well uh, to be able to invest. Uh, and, and, uh, and these are going to be um, um, big drivers for, uh, for m and in the, in the next uh, uh, two, three, four years. Thank, thanks, Ignacio. Yeah. Um, Tim, over to, over to you uh, as well. Like, I want to get your view. I mean, do you, do you envisage that deals um, that will be sort of cross-border deals with companies getting into the U.S.? Or again, are you, are you thinking it'll be more U.S. company focused you'll be working on in the future, the near future? You know, I think that is something that's going to be uh, driven a lot by potentially uh, interest rates here with the massive funding spending by the Fed and the potential um, currency valuation changes is going to be impactful here on how this is all going to uh, to take out. And I think to build on some of the comments on Ignacio, certainly the supply chain um, and where your food is coming from is kind of raising invisibility and, and where the um, source of that food and, and where it's been along the chain and the supply chain. And, and that's something that I think is going to be a further driver of uh, domestic production in the U.S. and a desire to um, you know, the, uh, for companies that will be recognizing here that there's more than just the lowest producer is there's also the political disruption, um, the geopolitical risks that are that are out there with the tariff situation, with reprocessing in China, lack of credit um, in some Asian countries with the reprocessors. And so to be able to bring that all home, I think, is in, and have that supply chain to be domestically produced in the U.S. is something that a lot of people are focused on. And I think that can certainly be something that is uh, you know, provided by outside investors. But I think there is a, a growing interest in uh, both the private equity community in the domestic market as well as in. Uh, and, and so I think that's really going to drive more activity within the U.S. Uh, for U.S. based businesses. Hmm. Do, you, do you foresee there'll be more kind of um, horizontal integration going on as well um, from, from U.S. companies as a result of this? Uh, well, this, I think the, that was, I think, probably the, the plan or maybe more longer term plans for folks, uh, you know, in the very beginning part of 2020 and what their longer term view is. But this uh, certainly has caused folks to understand their supply chain and customer base a lot better given the dynamic and, and changes with food service and retail and being able to place that product. So, um, you know, I think at this point there's, there is in seafood in general, uh, in the U S is one that is a lot of fragmented smaller players relative to the large protein players that we have in Purdue, Tyson, uh, JPS and the like. So until there's some larger scale, and I think that's where People are going to be continuing to get bigger in their own spaces. So I don't foresee necessarily to your comment on horizontal. That is going to be specific to certain companies. But um, I think the, the goal for a lot of folks right now is to continue to get scale and diversify their uh, their customer base and end markets. Okay. And, and with regards to what we're seeing now in the, in the Alaska salmon sector, could you give a bit of a kind of a top level view on, on the sort of M&A &A drivers there? I think it'd be quite interesting. Sure, can, uh, can certainly give some high level color on that front. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the, there's a, 
an element of some overcapacity in the production or in the processing side. And so in, that is really, I think, driving a lot of the consolidation at this point to be able to uh, remove some of that uh, excess capacity and allow for the harvest or excuse me, the processors to be able to optimize their um, processing footprint and be able to put um, you know the the necessary resources into the select few plants that they're able to to operate. Um, and I think that has been the goal and and was was the plan going into the 2020 season. And now the uh, impact of COVID has certainly, caused um, a much greater expense on being able to get their employees up to the plants, being able to uh, quarantine and, and isolate themselves so that they're not putting the local communities at a risk. And so that is going to be, I think, very critical as we're now just getting into the um, kickoff of that season. So, hmm. um, you know, I think that the the end result of that will, will likely be that, you know, there may be some more consolidation coming after uh, this season as, as it could be a, uh, potential impact for folks if the, if the openings aren't able to get done and they aren't able to have the processors in the, in the facilities. Yeah, it's still very, um, still very uncertain, isn't it? Um, I, I also wanted to, to ask you, um, about the, the American seafood sale process last year, which, th- which they announced early in the year and then, uh, essentially ended, well, say ended, I mean, I suppose the process never ends to, to some extent, but certainly no deal was done. I just wanted at a top level again, why you think that such a successful and profitable company that they weren't able to find a, a buyer for it in that process? Just, a, you know, some top level thoughts on that would be interesting. Sure. So I think when, um, you know, the the American seafoods uh, business is, a, you know, the largest and leading kind of best in class uh, asset in the Pollock fleet. And with that uh, commands a, a premium and has a, lo- a lot of long-term value that uh, is there. And so I think when the uh, business or the company announced that they were going to be uh, exploring a sale, wanted to uh, broaden that out. And um, you know, given the size of the asset and, and the strong cash flows, I think there's been, and then also the, the uh, regulatory restrictions of, on having domestic ownership limits the potential buyer universe. And um, I think given that and some of the uncertainty around what, um, you know, what what the uh, operation was going to be looking like going forward, what other growth opportunities are there for that particular business and the longer term strategy, I think coupled with, um, you know, some challenges in the uh, in some of the end markets that uh, they were experiencing. And then ultimately it comes down to, you know, being able to derive a, a value that the sellers wanted to uh, achieve. And so, um, you know, I think that given, given several of the moving parts and, and dynamic in that front was one in which, um, you know, weren't able to get to the finish line on. Hmm. Um, yeah, Ignacio, someone working in the, in, on the U S sector more, do you have a view on that, that deal as well as to, as to, to why it didn't happen? Yeah, I, uh, I think that, you know, Tim touched on, on a number of uh, truth about that, uh, that particular transaction. Uh, you know, two overriding concerns uh, for what I understand. One was, uh, you know, the valuation expectations on the seller side. Uh, and, and the other one that wasn't named yet, and it's a big elephant in the room uh, in, in the whole of the Alaska fishing complex is, you know, the need for renewed fleets. Uh, you know, it's a and the cost of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a there's a substantial amount of investment in the hundreds of millions of dollars that are coming due very very soon. Uh, and yes, you know, while the assets being sold and the business being sold, it's it's a you know best in class. Uh, at the same time, you know, you cannot really ignore that. You know, there are hundreds of millions of dollars coming due very soon, uh, and therefore you it's, it's almost at a point in time that you're you're buying the company twice, right? So uh, I think that, that caused a lot, of no- a lot of noise. You know, the, the way they tried to solve it was, uh, my understanding is, uh, you know, uh, splitting up the assets and trying to move, you know, quota holdings over other, over to other uh, uh, fishing boats. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, when a transaction becomes so complex, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it makes it much more difficult to uh, to get it to a uh, completion, right? 
Yeah, thanks. Before I um, move over to, to Europe, actually, for, for the audience, if you, if you want to ask questions, you can do that in the, uh, in the screen where you entered the, the webinar, and then um, we can then put these questions to the, the panelists at the end. So if you, you have any questions, just type away and we'll, we'll, we'll get them to the panel. Yeah, so, so moving over to, to Europe again, um, Jose Antonio, um, we've seen a lot of big global tuna deals over the years, uh, driven by the likes of Bolton, Thai Union and Dong Won. I mean, you, you, you kind of alluded to, to your views on this earlier, but I want to kind of go into it a bit more detail. But do you see that that will, will, will actually continue or do you think that that's going to kind of stop for the, for the foreseeable future? And then also, what about um, Latin America? Because there's been you know, lots of talk about um, big players looking to invest in, in, in Latin America. And it has happened with a couple of companies, for example, say um, Calvo um, with Gomez de Costa and then... Um, yep. Uh, Isabel, I guess, has assets in 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 Latin America. Anyway, but um, it's not happened as much as as it's, it's as it's been talked about. So, just yeah. two linked questions there. I just wanted your views on those. Yeah. Well, um, we've seen in the past, um, as you mentioned, Thai Union and um, and Bolton being very aggressive in the consolidation um, and it, their growth uh, via inorganic activity. Um, different strategies we've seen, you know, Thai Union stepping into the European market, um, buying into France, uh, buying into Germany, uh, trying to buy into Southern Europe as well. Uh, and we see Bolton on the defensive, uh, trying to, you know, making sure that uh, uh, they were the ones snapping up those assets available in places like Spain or Italy, especially in Spain, where we've seen some relevant transactions in the last number of years. Um, the, uh, I mean, what, what we're seeing right now, now is we still have a, a relevant number of independent, sizable, family-owned companies in the tuna space uh, across Europe. So you would have thought that uh, there's still, um, you know, a lot of a lot of activity uh, and a lot of um, you know, sort of transactions to happen in the um, in the short to medium term. Uh, you know, having said that, the uncertainty that everyone's facing that's probably going to uh, deter some of those potential buyers on, you know, pushing the button on cross-border activity. Um, when it comes to Latin America, one of the things that I, uh, you know, we think that um, potential buyers have struggled with is the fact that uh, many of the large uh, Latin American players um, have a um, you know, sort of vertical integration. Um, which, you know, owning boats and extractive fleet, which in um, many cases are probably deterring interest from the likes of, um, you know, uh, Thai Union or even Bolton stepping into those geographies. Um, but um, so I would have thought that um, having boats in the tuna space is something that is deterring the interest of those industrial players which would be happy to step in certain Latin American countries. And until those sort of local um, regional players start sort of separating their operations, industry on the one side, extractive on the other, um, we're going to probably struggle to see relevant transactions taking place in Latin America. Um, but overall, I would say that, that we still have a relevant number of sizable independent family-owned companies that would be very interesting for, uh, you know, the players that we've just mentioned. And um, yeah, Ignacio, you, 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 do you want to chip in there? Uh, yeah, two, two comments, I would say, uh, in terms of, the, uh, in terms of the, the canning sector in particular, you know, it has always been considered a little bit, you know, an old school and sexy uh, uh, sector of, of the seafood industry. You know, with uh, farm salmon being the star and modern and whatnot and uh, ras and all, all of those things that we like to see. However, you know, uh, it has proven to be the most resilient uh, and also right now, you know, the most profitable sector uh, within uh, the, the seafood industry complex. Um, you know, I think that uh, a number of people, you know, will look uh, or will take a second look at the unsexy sector as a way of diversifying and improving the quality of their earnings. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, there's, there's something to be said uh, about, you know, the stability of, of being in that, in that part of the industry. And I'm sorry, and with regards to LATAM, uh, you know, I would like also to share the fact that, you know, the difficulty many times in, in affecting transactions down there 
there is the lack of uh, uh, bank financing. Uh, you know, most of the transactions uh, in Latin America uh, have to be done with 100% equity or with debt raised, uh, you know, at the corporate level overseas. Um, you know, and that also adds an, an, another layer of complexity. Uh, however, you know, they tend to be uh, a bit compensated by, uh, you, know, uh, you know, slightly uh, discounted uh, valuation multiples uh, and, 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 and thicker, you know, many, many cases, you know, thicker profit margins. So those who are, uh, have a little bit more appetite for risk, uh, you know, they, they will find uh, very good investments. Uh, it's, it's obviously not for the faint of heart, but in the, in the medium term, they end up being very profitable, high return investments as well. Um, if, if I may, you know, there's, uh, and, and probably um, I, I agree with you in, in, in that sort of Latin America kind of attractiveness, and especially in this sector uh, on stability and so on. I would also add to the difficulty on doing deals in, in that specific region. I'd say one is currency. Um, which, uh, you know, you get a completely different exposure um, when you're stepping into certain of, you know, certain countries, volatility of, of, of currency, that's a major issue to consider. And, and from a deal execution perspective, the due diligence process, uh, you know, diligencing the legal, the tax, the finance, the labor on those countries uh, in certain companies tends to be very difficult, especially when you apply standards that you would see, you know, in other regions like you know, um, Europe or North America, um, just because those, you know, certain businesses are just run in a different way. Uh, the availability of information is much more scarce and therefore getting, you know, having enough comfort on currency risk, um, overseas um, industrial activity and, um, and the lack of diligence at the level that you would expect um, as Ignacio was saying, you have to adapt that and factor your risk appetite into the whole transaction. But having said that, uh, if I had you know, to put my money into specific regions, I'd say you know, Latin America will be definitely top of my list. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and this is a Latin America question, but one, one for you, um, Henning. Um, in, in, you know, in some, last year, we saw, um, I think it was, the, the, was in fact the top deal of the year was... Uh, was um, China's legend uh, paying close to a billion for Australis? Um, do you see that as an anomaly, and or do you, you know, envisage that um, there could potentially be more cross-border deals in in salmon farming, um, you know, this year or next? You're, mu you're muted, Henning. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Far away. You're still muted. I can hear. I can't. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You left him speechless. <laughs> you, you see, you, we can see, I can see you, but I can't hear you. <laughs> I, okay, see well, you. I can hear you, so I think it's more uh, a continental European uh, <laughs> good connection. <laughs> I can confirm that we cannot hear you in Asia. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll have to move move on then. If um, so, so, you can hear you can hear him, Matthias. But yeah, I can hear him. Uh, I couldn't hear. Yeah, that's that's really really strange. It, it, I also see Henning is logged in on several screens as well, which might also be part of the issue. Hmm. Anyway, um, anyway, moving on. Um, wanted to ask about the Icelandic uh, salmon <laughs> farming sector. Um, but I, I, actually, I mean, has anyone else got any views on on Chile? And, and, you know, like um, it sounds to me like um, farmers in Chile are probably um, you know, more under pressure in terms of um, in terms of the situation than than, Norwe than the Norwegian farmers, because you know, Brazil is in a terrible situation. Um, the U.S., the prices are going down in the U.S. And I guess they're just much more cut off in terms of the access to market than Norway. 
Um, do you think that that could potentially cause some sort of more defensive deals in Chile or, you know, um, other, you know, cross-border deals in Chile, as I asked? Or, you know, what, what do you, what, what, what do the guy, you, you guys think might happen there? I don't know if anyone's got a view on that. Yeah, we, we are in a couple of conversations with boards down there. Clearly, you know, the Chilean uh, seafood producers are feeling under pressure. Uh, and, and they are they have realized that uh, while they have excellent products, uh, at the same time, you know, they, they do not control the access to the market. So, again, I, this, is, this is a topic that we have been discussing for a few years now. I mean, there has to be north-south integration. There's clearly... You know, a group of uh, seafood producing countries in the, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, you know, the, the, the big consumption of seafood takes place in the northern hemisphere, but we still, you know, except for certain species, we do not see a, a very good level uh, of integration uh, north south. Uh, you know, I think it has to do with probably, you know, lack of size and lack of capital uh, on the on the producing side on the on the southern hemisphere producers uh, and lack of uh, um, lack of management capability, you know, management capability uh, and, and, and appetite for risk. Uh, uh, Ignacio? Yeah, I'm, I'm right here. I just, yeah. I finished when I had my plan, Dick. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, with um, with um, Henning, have you managed to unmute yourself there? Or <clears throat> is it working now? Yeah, it's working fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. perfect. Yeah, you can see you and hear you. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's your your view on the potential um, potential outlook for more of these? Do you see that as an anomaly that legend deal, or do you think that there is a chance that we could see more big kind of cross border salmon deals? And then you know, is a potential for more mergers within Chile as well? Do you think? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, and yeah, the answer is yes, but I can't be specific on on on, on, on targets, of course. But what we what we have seen uh, less cyclicality and more steady operations, and, and also the size and growth of the of the salmon farming industry attracts uh, more interest in in general. Uh, so on general basis, I think we can assume, uh, say, more cross border deals and bigger deals going forward. Okay, and then with um, we got to Iceland, which has been the you know um, kind of I guess Nordic cross border deals with Norwegian companies investing in Iceland in the salmon farming sector. What do you think the, the structure of the the, the the way that worked out with you know these, these four, four major companies all owned by Norway, all partly owned by Norwegians? Um, can somebody mute their microphone? A lot of um, I'm not sure who that is exactly. A lot of, Thanks. Um, do you think that what do you think will happen there in in in, in Iceland with that um, salmon farming sector? Do you see that kind of consolidation down further, or you know? Um, yeah. To... Yeah, no, yeah. Yes, I do. I do think so because the structure in Iceland is not optimal, but it, it's not that far away from optimal because Iceland started with clean sheets uh, not that many years ago, uh, and and took all the experience from the other regions and. Uh, but now we have two regions, two companies in each re region, and uh, and the size is suboptimal. Uh, so there's there's say, massive gains for all the players there to to uh, cooperate or uh, consolidate. So I I do think that we will uh, see some some consolidation in Chile. Yes. Okay. Well, well uh, Magnus. I mean, obviously that's it's your home patch uh, in Iceland. So, so what, what do you do you think about how the um, the you know the the, the outlook of the MMA with the, the um, salmon mm -hmm. there? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Henning. You know, I think we will see a further consolidation. Uh, the salmon industry in Iceland has been driven by Norwegian investments and expertise, and uh, that is well received here in Iceland. Uh, it has been going very well. Uh, production today is about 30,000 tons. I can see it easily go to more than 100,000 tons in the coming years. And uh, that is driven by new licenses, uh, opening up new fjords. We just have things taking place these days in Iceland, uh, which are uh, opening up for farming in, in Isabel. Uh, there are way too many companies today. 
and so there's obvious need for consolidation. Uh, I think when it comes to investments in CAI, I wouldn't be surprised to see more Icelandic capital participating in the industry, uh, both institutional money coming from pension funds and also from private uh, companies. Uh, how fast it will happen, I don't know, but uh, we are probably today, if we count land-based uh, and the salmon farming business in Iceland, we are probably talking about 10, 12 companies. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see them going down to four or five. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, all happening quite, yeah, in, in, in the next two, three years. Okay, thanks. And on the topic of, of Iceland, we've seen a kind of um, dizzying kind of um, series of deals with, uh, with, 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 with Brim, um, Brim and HB Grandy. It's very hard to follow what was going on at times. But um, do you think now that's kind of seemingly stabilised, do you think that that company, um, Brim, um, will, will look to, to expand more globally, um, as, say, kind of ISI and, and Samhari have done? And then another question with regards to Samhari, I mean, you know, given the, uh, the controversy over the, um, you know, the alleged manner of their expansion into Namibia, do you think that we could potentially see them retreat um, somewhat from, from international, um, kind of on the international stage or, or, or not? So sort of two linked questions for you there. Magnus, you're muted. Yeah, I said, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're coming through fine. Yeah. So if, if I would start with Samheri, uh, obviously a, a very strong company under a very professional good management. Uh, so, and, and then there is difference between allegations in media and, and actual kind of like uh, being brought to courts. And, and to my knowledge, you know, they have not been brought to any court. These are allegations and speculations. I think Samheri will weather that storm quite nicely and come out of it as a stronger company. And so they will definitely continue to transact internationally. The Brim, we have a, a, a quota ceiling here in Iceland that is quite low. Uh, even though when you listen to Icelandic news, they're always talking about uh, the big Icelandic fishing companies. But obviously we were talking about American seafoods uh, with their 250,000 tons. Uh, it's very, very kind of like we have Brim, a, a small company compared to that, and they have hit the Icelandic quota ceiling. So there is no other way for a company like Brim than, than expand outside of Iceland. Uh, they are now doing a very interesting thing in Greenland and, uh, and it seems to be developing nicely there. Uh, I, would, I would see kind of like that uh, in the future, Brim will continue to develop the business in Asia. Uh, they acquired Icelandic Asia from the Enterprise Investment Fund and, uh, and are now developing that asset in China, Japan. So, so that, 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 that will continue. Uh, Iceland Seafood, obviously, I'm, 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 I'm working for Iceland Seafood to be quite clear, kind of like as, as their M&A advisor. Uh, they have a stated goal of uh, continue their expansion in Europe and uh, is uh, in the market. We, we are listed here in Iceland and and we have stated uh, very ambitious growth goals. And in order to do that, uh, they, they, they will continue to, to, to acquire and, and to m a in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I think as I said with, with Brim, you know, there's really no other way for them to go than to expand outside of Iceland. Okay, well, 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 thanks, Magnus. Really good, good overview. Um, Matthias, to you, um, because it's kind of cross uh, cross cross the border thing. Um, do you think uh, that we'll see a kind of a, a pause in terms of cross border deals uh, with with regards to European companies, like um, companies from outside the block, say buying into Europe? Um, or do you think that that will continue, or or do you sort of envisage you'll be doing more sort of deals where it's, it's companies even say in Holland acquiring each other, or more kind of you know pan European deals as opposed to you know Asian or American companies buying into into Europe? Yeah, what we see, well, definitely there's a pulse in a, num a number of deals. Um, but I'm convinced, and also speaking with the large seafood companies outside Europe, the bigger ones, they still have an interest in Europe. But it's also a bit dependent on the size. Normally, if the, the size of a seafood company is bigger, 
uh, in, in a lot of cases, the quality of the asset is better in terms of the, 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 the production, but also the, the diversification of species, uh, of end markets, of customers. And therefore, uh, a larger company provides a good platform for companies outside Europe. And, uh, and we expect still interest from, uh, from people from Asia, but also from the US. Um, secondly, what, what we see is uh, larger seafood companies having, uh, which already have a presence in Europe. Uh, so they have the platform. They're also looking for small acquisitions uh, to increase the skill and scope and, and benefit from synergies. Uh, so that's also a clear tendency what we see. And thirdly, what will continue and what, 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 what's driving the consolidation play is smaller companies will acquire local competitors uh, to become bigger. Do you, do you think that, um, I'd like to ask everyone about their views on the role of private equity and uh, you know, investment companies in the sector, because we've seen you know, the, the data we, we've collated that I had in the presentation shows there's been a definite increase in that, quite surprisingly, actually. Um, do you think that that will play a part in this? Because um, you know, you've worked on quite a few pri private e deals involving private equities in Europe. Do you see that, 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 that that's going to accelerate, or do you just think it will be a stable thing? Well, in general, private equity is, is especially in Western Europe, a bit reluctant for the seafood industry. Um, and and uh, it was also already mentioned earlier, the seafood industry in, in this part of the world is, is relatively, in some cases, old-fashioned compared to other food industries. Um, and the industry as such is, 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 is very complex, complex in terms of the number of species where they're, where they're sourced and coming from. So in general, uh, private equity is reluctant. Uh, but you clearly see that uh, there are a number of private equity investors w w which are entrepreneurial and have a hands-on focus or a, a hands-on uh, way of, of, of being involved with companies that have an interest in, in good uh, uh, seafood companies where they can improve the company and professionalize the, the assets, but also uh, do the buy and build. Uh, the buy and build is what, what we see clearly as a driver uh, which triggers the interest of, of private equity. But, but you need to know that not all private equity investments in seafood in Western Europe have been that positive. There are a lot of uh, you know, yeah. difficult investments that have been made. Mm. Um, that brings actually brings me to, to to you, Jose Antonio. I mean, you've seen a, there's been a plenty of um, private equity deals in 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 Spain or you know in the Iberian, yeah. uh, Spain and Portugal. Um, do, what do you think? You know, do you think that that um, there was actually it was a real kind of fad? There was just a big series of them. Do you think that that yeah. again is going to continue, or have we seen that? You know, have they moved on to other things <laughs> in terms of the kind of? Yeah, well, it's it's funny because sometimes you see this happening as a bit of a fashion and. Um, and all of a sudden, um, you know, you see a relevant sort of local private equity house stepping into a specific industry, and all of a sudden you have a flock of, you know, flocking them, uh, the rest of them flocking into that specific industry. Um, we've seen this in Spain. Uh, we had seen, um, you know, private equity guys uh, just forgetting about this industry for many years, and um, all of a sudden we had a number of them stepping in you know sort of back again uh, it's not only local private equity houses like maybe alantra buying union martin or ged buying the octopus process or the cefa uh, but it's also large international ones such as platinum buying iberconsa which is the second largest seafood uh, frozen seafood player in spain just behind pescanova uh, we've even seen Abanca, which is a bank uh, buying buying out other financial investors out of Pescanova. So, uh, you know, all of a sudden we've seen the renewed interest in the industry. But I, I, I tend to agree with what Matthias was saying, which is the fact that this is a complex industry um, with um, uh, a high degree of volatility um, when it comes to prices. 
um, and not necessarily a, a sector which is easy to finance from a lender's perspective. At the end of the day, you know, you have banks saying, well, hold on, just let, you know, let me understand how the dynamics of pricing of the raw material plays out here. Um, how do I, you know, cover my position as a lender in this specific investment? So, uh, having said that, you know, we, we've seen that that interest from private equity happening in the recent past. The question is, uh, will we see this happening in the short to medium term? We've definitely seen private equity houses stepping into primary sector, especially in the agribusiness side of things. Um, just thinking that this is an industry that should be resilient. People need to eat, as some of the panelists mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, but volatility around um, raw material pricing is, I'd say, the number one element that, to a certain extent, uh, deters a bit of that interest from the private equity industry. You mentioned there um, the the platinum deal for Ibiza and then a banker in Pescanova. I mean, what do you see as likely exits for, for those investments? Because um, if if um, if uh, Portobello wasn't able to sell um, Ibiza to a, another to trade. trade, will yeah. Platinum be able to? And and kind of the same with um, with a banker in Pescanova, really. I mean, you know, how do you see that playing out? Yeah. Well, the um, the reality is that when it comes to specific sector or a specific species such as, you know, cake or shrimp, which are probably the ones where Pescanova and Iberconza are strong in, um, scale is everything to attract interest from the large sort of Asian players such as the Marujas, uh, Nisuis and so on. I mean, and when I mean scale, that's north of 100 million euros of EBITDA. Um, uh, when you reach that point, you basically have two or three alternatives playing out in the same way, which you can either IPO a business. Uh, in countries such as Spain, you need certain scale um, to float a business into the public market, and that is typically more than 100 million EBITDA uh, business. Uh, and similarly, you know, happens with attracting trade. And I think one of the things that have been an issue when selling businesses in specific species, I'm not talking about other species where, for example, tuna or even octopus, uh, scale is not that relevant. Uh, it is relevant, but not that relevant. Uh, when it comes to sort of, you know, global species such as, as mentioned, hake or shrimp, scale is everything. So if you want to have different alternatives as exit options, and that is selling to trade, IPOing a business, or even a secondary or tertiary buyout to a private equity house, you need scale. And I think one of the things that Portobello struggled with is building a business above 100 million euro EBITDA to really attract um, uh, players from, you know, regions such as Asia. I mean, it was not a coincidence that Nomura had the sell side mandate for Iberconza. It was very clear that we're going to attract interest from Asian buyers. But that didn't happen, as you mentioned. I think scale is everything. Well, there was interest, wasn't there? But it didn't seem to go beyond that. It was interest. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, great. And actually, just um, before we kind of look at getting some questions from the audience, because there's quite a lot come in. Alan, I wanted to get a bit of a sense from you about um, private equity in Asia. I mean, we've seen quite a few, um, well, I say quite a few, at least some notable deals. The, the biggest uh, that I can think of being Pamira buying into Growbest uh, in the kind of feed sector in Asia. Um, do, you, do, you, do you, you know, why have we not seen more of those deals with, uh, you know, private equities buying into to, uh, to Asia and, you know, is there an opportunity there with, with the pandemic or is it going to really deter them? Well, I, I echo with Jose's view that people need to eat and, you know, private equity loves sticky customers and, you know, no matter with or without pandemic, people are going to eat seafood and that, that is very attractive to financial investors who are looking for that kind of cash flow stability. Now, getting to cash flow stability that in Asia ultimately is a seafood exporting kind of uh, economy and the volatility of farm gate prices or export prices of seafood uh, coupled with uh, a number of governance issues have made you know seafood investment quite hard for PE um, and that is also th that in, in Asia in particular that when you go for an IPO that um, biological asset risk is also something that 
for example, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange does not really like. So if you are trying to IPO something with a lot of biological assets, it, it can be challenging in, in this part of the world. Now, having said that, you know, Strategic and PE is that both continue to express interest in a number of ongoing seafood deals. Um, if the difference between these two is that the strategics are looking in areas and business with lower geopolitical risk, whereas the private equities are looking for like a middle class consumer story. Um, I, I think I think I, I can't I can't say for everyone, but I would think that many management teams I've talked to says that the pandemic is a transient matter. It will not change the long term trend in Asia. Uh, indeed, the, the pandemic has been a massive boost for uh, for seafood e-commerce in China, for example. So I, I would foresee that a lot of you know investments are, are still coming in into into this part of the world. Um, but with, with I think, and indeed for for Alpine as well. But the difference here is that I think Western investors or, or PE investors are uh, having an increased appetite in Southeast Asia. Uh, investors out of China whether they're strategics or financials, they are seeking to deploy capital offshore. And in the meantime, everyone is looking at equity investments. So uh, and that involves, that includes the seafood sector as well. Yeah, if I may there, Tom, I'd like to chime in. You know, the, the issue that you have with Asian buyers, uh, in, many case, uh, in many cases, it has to do with scale, but even more important, you know, their lack of uh, management capability. Hmm. I mean, they, they even though they are good traders and they purchase, you know, products from around the world, uh, they do not have the management capability, expertise, you know, uh, cross border to go and take over, you know, a major fishing operation uh, overseas. Uh, you know, the only the only great example that we have are, in, you know, in North America and Europe. But uh, but you know, I think that, for example, in the case of uh, of other Australis, even in Chile, I think they're still struggling there. Uh, and we haven't seen really, you know, a, a major player taking, uh, you know, taking over a fishing operation uh, in Latin America recently. Uh, quite the opposite. I mean, if you remember a few years ago, many of the Japanese houses actually exited. So, you know, uh, I, I think that uh, on that note, also, you know, the 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 I would say. You know the, the the strategy follow for the Iberconsa sale of trying to target you know the uh, the Asian houses. Uh, you know probably was a mistake from the beginning. Mm. That's why it didn't end up there. I mean, also, you know the uh, the Asian market does not demand uh, cake. So, you know, I leave a question mark there. Yeah, um, maybe just to round things off before we take some questions from the audience because we're. We're at kind of tight. We're, we're, we started a bit late, so we can run over. But um, I just like everybody to give, say, a thirty-second, uh, you know, kind of looking a bit longer term. I and mean, Alan kind of um, said there that he feels that um, this is more of a transient thing, uh, you know, to, in terms of Asia, and it won't necessarily have a huge long-term impact. But what does everybody think about that? I mean, looking into twenty twenty-one or twenty twenty-two, further into the future, do you think that this is, you know, how do you think this is going to reshape? The seafood sector, with regards to M and A, or, or do you think that things will kind of, you know, drop back to the sense of how it used to be and carry on like that? What is maybe Ignacio, you could start seeing as you were just speaking. Yeah, I, I think that I would. I would like to to know uh, if I had a crystal ball here. Is you know who's going to be the next cook? You know, clearly, you know, in order to be successful in the in the world of seafood, you have to be sizable. You have to be diversified by species. You have to be diversified by currency. You have to be diversified by geography, right? Uh, and 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 that gives you, you know, more stability of earnings, you know, uh, because of the portfolio diversification embedded into the structure of the company. Uh, and and there has been, you know, really, you know, one player that has had the vision, uh, uh, you know, to go and and, uh, and execute on, on a plan like that. Uh, but we probably need four of those at least, five of those at least, um, you know, and, and, and then the industry as a whole is going to be also more stable and more attractive. Um, so my question is, you know, who's going to be the next book? It's yeah, re really, really, um, really good point. Um, yeah, Henning, maybe what, what's your kind of crystal ball, um, crystal ball view? 
No, no. <clears throat> no, I, I think we, I think uh, actually that the pandemic on the salmon uh, sector at least uh, will not say be a game changer on the consolidation, but it will be. If anything, it will be uh, a trigger for increased consolidation at some point, but I don't see, see that as, as, the, as the main draw. I, I agree more with uh, Ignacio to see um, uh, more consolidation uh, through the value chain, if not in, in particular or, or, or different species and, and different markets, but uh, through the, more through the, the, the value chain. I think that this kind of crisis is, is, is kind of triggering that kind of, of uh, consolidation. So sort of accelerating something that was happening anyway. Um, yeah. yeah. Matthias, what's, what's your crystal ball um, sound bite? Yeah, I, I think I, I agree what already has been said, um, but I expect a further shakeout of a, of a smaller processors and I will expect that the larger ones which are already strong today will become stronger and stronger and stronger uh, and I expect some of the Asians uh, and Japanese or Chinese companies uh, will become uh, very um, uh, will have a large influence around the world and if if they have or once they control the resources. That's, I think, what I expect. Thanks, um, Tim. Well, I think uh, it's hard to uh, see into the crystal ball here, given the fog of COVID and, and the consumer changes. So. You know, I think once once there's some clarity in that, there will certainly be some winners and losers and business models that were, uh, you know, highly dependent on one or two end markets will be um, impacted dramatically. And that will certainly allow for either the opportunity for a acquisition of an existing business or for the stronger players, as others have mentioned, will be able to come in and uh, just take over their customer base with their with the size and capabilities and ability to execute and uh, be more nimble and being able to switch to the end markets, which are showing the, de the necessary demand and uh, be able to execute and sell their product through. So, um, you know, I think at this point, still a very, uh, un a lot of unknowns and, and one in which will, I think, take some time and then be pe folks will be able to understand where they are going to be able to invest and continue to uh, to excel and grow their business. Well, fact, yeah, thanks, um, Jose Antonio. Have you got a bit of a crystal ball kind of, you know, big picture, longer term? Yeah, um, but I think everything has been said um, in terms of that you know, crystal ball. Um, uncertainty is going to be probably just you know determining next steps, um, being nimble, as as as, as Tim was saying, is going to be key. Uh, and I do see, um, you know, certain path towards um, further local consolidation with small and medium companies, which are still family owned, probably integrating themselves into larger players. Okay, I think I'm going to cut to a couple of questions from um, from from the audience now because there's been some interesting ones. One I'm going to throw at you, Magnus, um, which is throwing the B word out there. Um, someone's asked about Brexit. Um, and asked it, what what the it's uh, Julio Torre from from Argentina from from the Red Ass publication in Argentina. He's asked, um, is there any uh, you know how will the kind of the Brexit post process influence M and A? And I guess probably uh, Magnus and Matthias would be the best people to answer that because um, anyone else could chip in because see so Magnus several Icelandic companies have investments in the UK uh, with Sam Harry invested in fishing and and also downstream and then you've got. Um, uh, yeah, it, you've got, uh, you know, ISI is also in processing. So, yeah, what do you think uh, with regards to Brexit and M&A? It's a big topic. But, yeah. yeah, well, it is now in the shadow of the COVID, isn't it? But uh, it, it, it is something that uh, has been thought about a lot in, in the last uh, one or two years. Uh, I think if you look at the UK market, there's a massive overcapacity in processing. Uh, so I think it is it is obvious that uh, the weaker and smaller processes will be acquired by the bigger or, or they will simply close down. 
So I think there will be a consolidation lot in the secondary processing where you will see uh, bigger companies being formed. So you obviously have Young's and you have uh, CTIL uh, and, and uh, ISI and, and other companies there who are kind of like with a very clear strategy on how they're going to grow. And uh, I think uh, just it, 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 it reflects the UK retail uh, and, and the food service market, which has already consolidated. And uh, if you're going to supply Tesco or Sainsbury or any of those big companies, then you have to have scale. And, and that scale has also to have a prof professional management and access to capital. And I think that is also kind of like to uh, very much in light with what Ignacio said uh, about the crystal ball. You know, you, who is the next Glenn Cook? Uh, who will be able to, to match capital with management expertise? Uh, that is always the winning formula you need to have have those two ingredients in order to create a success story. And, and there will be several success stories in, in, in coming years in seafood because there's a, there's a need for consolidation. But that is the same with, 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 uh, with the UK market and Brexit. Um, maybe, Matthias, you, you know, obviously there's several Dutch companies um, that own, uh, quote, you know, fishing companies in the UK as well. What's the feeling in, um, in, 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 in Holland um, with regards to how Brexit could you know, cause M and A either as an opportunity or or a risk. I suppose it's it's currently maybe hard to see. But what do you think? Well, it's definitely more a risk. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there are large, the larger ones, uh, but also several smaller fishing companies have UK quota, and they uh, the possibility is that they lose their rights. And that will have a massive impact on, on the larger, but also the local fishing uh, companies. So it's it's uh, already question mark for, for a couple of years. And uh, but it's from the Dutch side, it's uh, a very big thing in the, in the whole discussions with uh, uh, related to the Brexit. Yeah, because you've got obviously um, Vrolik and... Um... Frolic and PMP own, you know, the big guys, but there's actually lots of smaller companies in the sort of beam, beam trawling. Uh, they also operate in UK waters, aren't they? So it's quite a yeah, major yep. issue. Um, yeah, um, there's, there's actually a question from uh, from someone from the US here, which I can answer, um, which is, uh, was the Alaska, was the Ocean Beauty and Cook icicle merger only Alaskan operations, or did it include US mainland? Brad, uh, but rather that was um, that was only the Alaskan operations. It doesn't include any of the um, US mainland operations. Um, we also have a interesting question here on on a, on the China fishery Kapinka situation. Has anybody um, basically just asking for an update on that? Has, has anyone got a kind of viewpoint on where they think that's going to go? I mean that that that's been going since I think maybe 2016, 17. That went into Chapter 11. What's what's going to happen there? I mean, <laughs> does anyone have a view on that? Ignacio, maybe? Uh, yeah, that, uh, that situation started when I was young. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not only the situation itself is complicated, but, but it also has been, you know, uh, in my view, tremendously mismanaged, you know, with a lot of hype uh, and not enough results. Um, you know, there, I think I believe that the trustee is still trying to clean things up uh, to make it an attractive asset. But uh, but when they had the chance, they were also probably expecting you know valuation levels mm -hmm. that are uh, extremely difficult to justify, uh, particularly because of the volatility uh, in the in the uh, um, fishery itself. Uh, and and uh, and also you know the the, the country risk itself. I mean, uh, a billion dollars in Peru is ten billion dollars elsewhere, uh, and and if it is not a, a simple, straightforward, plain vanilla, clean transaction, uh, it becomes very difficult to execute. Uh, we obviously looked at it, uh, and and we obviously also you know walked away from it. Uh, even as advisors, because we saw that the complexity there was such that uh, it was not going to be, uh, uh, you know, completed within a reasonable uh, mm -hmm. time frame. Uh, you know, what's going to happen now 
if anyone knows, I mean, uh, you would have to ask the trustee, uh, you know, when the company is going to be clean and, and when uh, and when they are going to accept, you know, valuation levels that, uh, you know, make it attractive for buyers to, to step in and take on that level of risk. You know, it, it seems that the only view here so far has been that of the seller. Uh, and when that is the case, you know, transactions just do not happen. Hmm. Another um, uh, another question has come in here about um, is there is there a continued demand from Chinese companies for buying Latin American or Norwegian assets? Uh, is anyone still seeing that? Um, if, if yeah, I may, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Please, please do. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, thank you. Um, the question is that would the Chinese kind of company still go abroad? I think I think the answer is yes because uh, the, the the issue here is that they want to deploy capital offshore, um, despite the fact that there's a lot of geopolitical risk. Um, the challenge here is whether the incoming countries will accept the capital. Um, that that remains to be uh, you know that that remains to be a big uncertainty in, in certain jurisdiction. Um, but overall, the Chinese is still trying to secure food resources globally, um, and that trend will continue. Yeah, and on, on, the, on the flip side, if you, look at, if you look at dealing with, you know, Chinese buyers from a seller point of view, uh, you know, some of the difficulties have been, again, not only uh, at the language level, but also, you know, the, the requirement for Chinese companies to have you know, certain levels of approval, uh, yes. either at the, at the at the provincial or or federal government, in order to access the capital and be able to conclude the transaction, that makes the transactions you know uh, long again and more difficult. Mm. Uh, what I would caution you know the the potential you know Chinese buyers is that there is a wave in Europe uh, at, at uh, different uh, countries uh, uh, congressional levels. Uh, in passing uh, protection laws, where you know, just like you know, the U.S. has uh, you know all kinds of transactions uh, in certain industry sectors, including food, uh, will have to be now uh, government approved. Uh, and I think that that is going to add a level of complexity to the M and A process. Uh, and yes. that is something that we are absolutely aware is taking place in certain jurisdictions in Europe. Uh, it has not yet uh, resulted in similar uh, efforts in other countries. But I think that if, in, if Europe does it, uh, it's possible that other countries will do will put in place those protectionist uh, regulations as well. Well, yes, absolutely, and and that and when when we do M and A in China. And, and that's outside of seafood. We're doing M and A and investments in general in China. We're talking about onshore capital, offshore capital, and offshore generally means Hong Kong. Um, and if the capital is in Hong Kong, then that's that's an open economy. You know, you can invest from anywhere to China to Chile the next day. There's no restriction whatsoever. If the capital is in China, there are a lot of approvals and a lot of processes that that could involve and. Indeed, we have talked to a number of state-owned and privately-owned firms in China, and that is they're, they're acutely aware of this limitation. Um, and and of course, like the process, the, the bureaucracies required for approval is uh, inherently complicated for large firms or state-owned companies, and that applies to not only in China but also perhaps in other Asian economies as well. Um, but that that goes that goes on to the to the kind of the beginning of the beginning of the long trade conflict that. We may about to experience, um, and and that would really change the way that, in particular, for China to do outbound deals. Um, it, it will have a dramatic effect from from the seller communities. Uh, so so with advisors that 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 I represent many seafood companies here that you will you will understand the the complexity of dealing with um, with uh, uh, buyers from China and indeed from many Asian economies, um, but. But at the same time, where I think this is where you know advisor communities and, and professional service communities can stick together and offer advice and you know friendly tips on how to deal with different situations. And from my experience, for 
Asian investors going outside of Asia, it's very important for them to be well prepared and to think about how do they get to the end and then plan backwards to see how much time they need. And that's the advice that I always give to you know, Asian clients going offshore, you know, whether going outside, going you know, to a different Asian countries or, or going outside of Asia. Okay, thank, thanks, Alan. Well, um, we've, we've, we've run over time there, but there was just so much to cover and a lot of good questions came in. But um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. So um, thanks, thanks so much for, um, for everyone on the panel for doing this. Um, hope uh, the listeners found this informative and useful. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, have a good uh, afternoon, uh, evening or night in the case of Alan and those in Asia. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.